We all saw Elon Musk cheering Netanyahu during his address to Congress last week. This man is the person who now controls our freedom of speech here on X. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another video. Today, I'm going to dig into some aspects of Netanyahu's talk to Congress last week. We are also going to look a little bit at China's stance on the Palestine issue, which means we're going to touch on the Beijing Declaration a little bit. I do plan to make a separate video that's going to go deeper into China's diplomacy worldwide, which is changing really rapidly. And that's going to include, include a little bit of uh, the situation with Ukraine as well. So make sure to hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so yet. Now, the initial point to recognize is that this was an Israeli event, not a Jewish one. We don't want to be blamed of being anti-Semite. Now, the, the gap between the level of protest and the level of repression keeps growing wider and wider in the United States. That is something to notice. During the speech week, authorities arrested 400 Jewish protesters outside Congress for opposing Israel's actions. At the same time, the police were pepper spraying thousands of people, demonstrators. This contrasts greatly with US politicians' support for the year-long unrest in Hong Kong in 2019, remember? So consider that. Consider that when you hear about House Speaker Mike Johnson's empty threat to arrest lawmakers with differing views. This odd move by Johnson clashes with American lawmakers' constant claims that free speech is right and key to US democracy, yet elected officials can't not speak in their own chamber. They cannot communicate what they feel and what they see taking place. This threat by Mr. Johnson might explain why many lawmakers that are progressive and that are Israel critics stated that they were skipping this event. This does not let Kamala Harris off the hook, though. She literally chickened out. She chose a pre-planned sorority trip in Indiana over her role as Senate president, as it is outlined in the Constitution. She should have been there. But picture how that would have looked like. Either way, whether she was clapping along or not clapping, either way would be horrible. You know, you know the people that were clapping, right? Even Elon Musk, we saw him clapping Netanyahu's worst. So, like I mentioned about this video, today is not going to be focusing on what was said by Netanyahu, but on what it actually means for America. What does it say, for instance, that this disliked, charged, mass murdering war criminal is giving now his fourth speech to join Congress when Winston Churchill gave only three? What does it mean that this mass murdering war criminal got so many standing ovations as he was talking? The gap between US leaders and citizens is just huge nowadays. But dislike for the Gaza war seems to be lessening. In March, 36% of Americans backed Israel's Gaza military actions, while 55% opposed them. Now, 42% approve and 48% disapprove. It looks like a constant image of death and hurting Palestinian women and children is numbing many Americans who now worry more about home, social and money issues than the war. Here is something to think about. U.S. poverty has hit its highest point in over 50 years after federal poverty levels went up 4.1% on average this year. More Americans today are trying to figure out how to feed their families. They don't have time to really worry about people dying far away. Netanyahu's speech shows a, a new side. His talk was APAC's best show of power over U.S. politicians yet. It proves how much this Israeli lobby sways America. But Netanyahu's call for war with Iran might hurt APAC in the long run. This means that if the neocons back Israel going after Iran, they will have to put aside their wish to hold back China. They won't be able to do both. 
But before, neocons stood with Israel. But what about China and this shift to Asia? We're going to see which way the war machine pushes its paid helpers in Congress on this particular choice, because they cannot do both. So if the war industry thinks that China matters more than Iran, then this could start the end of APEC's pool in America. One thing is clear, though. The war in Ukraine is ending. Trump told Zelensky straight up, it's done. President Zelensky called me and we had a good talk. And I said, we got to get this war over. This is a war machine. You're facing a war machine. That's what they do is they fight wars. They beat Hitler. They beat Napoleon. They're fighting a war. Trump also met Netanyahu at Mar-a-Lago. And that to me is another sign that the war machine is moving to the next fight. Now, Congress's choice to let a war criminal speak on its floor clashes with China's ongoing diplomatic success. The Beijing Declaration, which brings Palestinian groups together and sets them up to hold elections, was a very needed first step to stop fighting, make peace, and create a two-state solution. After this deal, China sent his diplomats around the globe to gain support for this plan. Because with elections and a government backed by several world powers, then Israel cannot claim that Hamas is running Palestine anymore. The Beijing Declaration shows us smart diplomacy that doesn't force action, but just lists the main steps that are needed in order to get to the objective. In this case, first, end the fight and start talking, then create the right setting for the talks. This means keeping things safe during the process and showing a way to build and grow after the conflict is over. I cannot think of a better country to help create a new future for Palestine, given what they've done in the last 40 years here in the country. But what challenges does China face? Netanyahu's Abrahamic alliance aims to undo China's work to make peace between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The US sees the Middle East as a chess piece in its global strategy. It is really hard to understand what the end goal is as shaking up the Middle East doesn't help the U.S. right now. Supporting Israel's wish to wipe out Palestinians is not a must-have for a strategy for them. In the past, the U.S. needed to secure energy access, right, oil. But these days, OPEC can keep oil flowing and prices in check, which keeps American energy profits steady. There's also a moderate precedent in Iran. We could also open doors for better connections and better ties with them. So looking at it from any strategic angle, I cannot find any reason to back yet another never-ending, unwinnable conflict. Why are they doing this? Does this approach make America stronger? Does it make it safer? Does it make it more liked worldwide? Not at all. In fact, it's doing the exact opposite. The US policy of giving Israel unconditional support is both a strategic mistake and a moral catastrophe. In the future, people will look back at this as a terrible genocide that Washington allowed to happen. And the only ones who don't seem to get this are the folks in Washington themselves. All right, friends, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for watching this video. And as always, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you like the content on my channel, consider subscribing. Make sure to like, comment, share, subscribe. And uh, well, if you want to support the work that I do, make sure to hit the link in the description down below to buy me a cup of coffee or hit the QR code on the screen over here <laughs> to buy me a cup of coffee. And well, until I see you again, take it easy and bye for now.